Guys, what is up? This is Amir Amanlari, UCST Department of Emergency Medicine, discussing ultrasound guided thoracentesis. A few words before we begin. The indications for thoracentesis are therapeutic and or diagnostic drainage of a pleural effusion. Ultrasound has long been demonstrated to be superior to chest x-ray for detection of pleural fluid. Ultrasound guidance is associated with a significantly lower risk of pneumothorax and solid organ injury. The pleural space is bordered by the visceral and parietal pleura. When the patient is in a supine position, fluid in the pleural space is seen as anechoic or dark above the brightly echogenic or white diaphragm. Step one, position and prep the patient. The patient should be seated on the edge of the bed, slightly leaning forward. Using the ultrasound, identify the location of the pleural fluid and use the skin marker to mark the area. Make sure that you mark the location of the ribs and the depth of the effusion. Pay attention to movement of the diaphragm and lung during respiration and mark a location that avoids those structures. Open the kit, prep in sterile fashion, and drape. This image demonstrates how the operator has measured the distance of the musculature in the chest wall as well as the distance to the lung. It is between this area that you want to perform your procedure. Step two, perform the procedure. For this, we have recruited Dr. Joe Brown. Hey Stu, we're back. This time we're going to do a thoracentesis. Based on the paracentesis video, we've already got our sterile probe cover and our same kit is out and open. So in this case, what we're looking to do is pull fluid from the back of the lung. Generally, what you're going to use as markers here are going to be the scapula. And if you can palpate the sort of the apex of the scap, the inferior apex of the scapula, that's going to be a good line to shoot at actually doing the procedure. You're going to go maybe within one to two finger breaths of that side. The way to start this procedure again, you get your sterile probe cover, you get your jelly from off the screen, and in this case, what you're going to be looking for on her back is going up and down. You can see each one of those pleural spaces. You can see that nice ants marching right along the top, and what you would be doing if there was actually fluid in here is you're going to identify that apex of the scapula and go up and down on her back until you can identify the um, her diaphragm and you can see sort of what windows and you're going to mark the inferior and superior aspect of where the diaphragm is moving to so that you can identify the safest pocket which width to do the procedure. Ideally, if you're on the left, you're not taking a, a biopsy of the, um, of the liver, and if on the right, you're not hitting any of the spleen. So let's say we've got our two spots here. Again, there's a sterile marker in the kit that comes with it. So you might give yourself a little window here. Here, We're assuming this whole field has already been chloroprepped. In the real life, you would not have her in her bra. You'd have her just in the gown. We're going to use that same kit again. So if you're looking at it, the nice thing about this before it gets spring-loaded is it's pigtailed, so it avoids puncturing the lung. There's apparently a 6% decreased odds ratio of whatever Amir just made up when he was <laughs> talking about it before the procedure. But theoretically, it makes sense, right? As soon as you get in, the pigtail will start curling down and away from the lung so that there's less irritation to the lung itself. So you can see it again. We're spring-loading it. Once it's in, you'll have a nice little con uh, connection here. If you have any issues, you can always pop off. There's a there's the kit when it starts. It should have where's our where's our little protector guy? This thing. So this will always start on it. So and get this back open. We've already got our spot identified on her back that we're gonna do this. Again, let's say we've numbed up the skin. You're gonna take your scalpel, go somewhere in the middle of the line. You're gonna give yourself a nice little skin puncture so that you don't have any issues getting that first part of the catheter through, maintaining a perpendicular angle. We're pushing, pushing, pushing. You'll feel that nice pop, always withdrawing the back syringe. As soon as that goes through and you get a nice flash of fluid, you're advancing the catheter. And again, as you see, this is starting to curl down in a way until it's in. 
Now what you've got is you've got a closed system with this into the, the pleural cavity. And what you're going to do is utilize, again, your big catheter here. You can pull back. Typically the way you'll do it, if you pull the fluid out too quickly, you can cause coughing and other irritation to the lung. So it is a little bit more tedious, but what you may end up doing is connecting this, turning it off to your big collection, pulling back a full 60 cc's so that if it's open here, you're pulling off the full 60 cc's into this. Boom, once that's full, you're going to turn it off to the patient, flush that into your bag or whatever you're collecting in, as opposed to using the, the vacuum seals, just because that can take it out a little too quickly. Main difference between this procedure and the paracentesis being generally not taking off more than one to one and a half liters, whereas in the, uh, the paracentesis you're taking off a max of about five liters. Again, when you're done, just like when you're re removing an IJ or any other procedure, you're going to have your patient start humming for you. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll have her go, Amanda, start humming. And then you'll have your occlusive dressing, so go for it. Boom. Pull straight out, keep it covered, put your next occlusive dressing over the top, and then you're all set to go. Great job. Jiro Brown, you're the man. And a special thanks to Amanda Nosser for being such an awesome model for us. So, lastly, a few pearls and pitfalls. In the coagulopathic patient, if at all possible, it would be wise to correct the coagulopathy, especially if the INR is greater than 1.5 times the normal limit. The operator should appreciate that the, that the diaphragm moves with respiration and map where it is during inspiration and expiration to make sure that the operator avoids that area for puncture. Do not remove more than 1.5 liters of pleural fluid due to the risk of post-expansion pneumothorax and pulmonary edema. Lastly, when you remove the, the catheter, the last three centimeters should be removed quickly during expiration to avoid any damage. Thank you for watching How to Perform an Ultrasound Guided Thorsentesis.